I'm John Buchanan, and in this video, we're going to look at some of Logic Pro's Mixer workflow features. I've got a track here. It's not very deep yet, just four tracks, but we're just beginning to be at the stage where actually opening the mixer and seeing what we can do within it would be advantageous. Before we do that, let's just have a listen to this little loop that I've got going. Okay, so the track's got a bit of a vibe, but what we are gonna do now is just to see what we can do to sort of enhance that a little bit by opening up the mixer. Now I can do that by clicking this button here. This button up in the top left-hand corner opens up the mixer, or you can see that there's a shortcut to it, which is just to press X. I'm gonna press this button and the mixer opens. Now, as I say, the mixer at the moment isn't going to be that big. Logic's mixer expands as you add new features. So at the moment, we'll be able to see a direct relationship between everything on the screen and everything that exists within the mixer. And we can see that actually Logic makes that very straightforward for us. If I click on this first track up here, which is the main beat loop, you can see that correspondingly it highlights down here in the mixer section. So what I can see is a channel strip for every single feature within each sound. I can see that at the moment, this is obviously an audio track which doesn't have any additional effects on it. I can see what its uh, sort of fader position is. I can see that it's not yet panned and so on and so forth. And I can go through each individual track and I can work this way just moving from one sound to the next. So, so far, so straightforward. So one thing obviously that I can do is to make sure that my volume balances are the way that I want them to be. And obviously by having the mixer open, rather than dealing with one sound at a time, as we can within Logic's main page, what I can do is to adjust volume balances across the entire group of sounds down here within the mixer. But we can begin to see how the mixer expands if we start adding more effects. I'm gonna take this synth sound here, and what I want to do is to set up a reverb for it, which maybe I can use on a couple of other sounds as well. So what I'm going to do is to select that I want to set up a new auxiliary, which I'm going to set up here, to bus number two, and automatically that's created within the mixer. We've just gained an extra channel to show that we've got an extra track to work with. I'm gonna turn up the send to this instrument here, and what I can then do is to choose the sound that I want. I'm gonna grab Space Designer uh, Logic's Reverb, um, which is just here, and we'll just go with the kind of default um, sound here for the moment. And obviously what I can do within the mixer, first of all, is to also label this. So if I decide I want this to be reverb, I can double click and add the word reverb here, which makes it much easier for me to see what all of my auxiliaries are. I can also see that the icon is different. Auxiliary tracks or auxiliary buses have this uh, dial icon in, um, immediate. It's worth familiarizing yourself with the icons within Logic so you can immediately see which tracks are which. So now what I've got is a reverb which is being sent from this sound. If I solo it, we should hear that reverb very clearly. We're gonna hear the space that's being added to that sound. And if I want to, I can add that to another sound within my mix as well. And of course, now that that track has been added to the mixer, it's as simple as selecting the same auxiliary bus on the sound to which I want to add the reverb, and then again, just add um, some volume via its send dial. So we'll hear that now on this sound too. So now we've got reverb added to two tracks. And of course, if I want more reverb on one sound, I can simply attenuate um, by turning down the amount of send on this sound. So if I want a little bit less reverb on that sound, but more on another, then obviously I can add those um, just via those send controls. So we now know how to add more auxiliary buses for effects to our mixer workflow. Um, and we also know that we've got control here over a range of other things as well, including volume. And we've got our pan dial if we decide we want to take a sound and move it from one side to another. So for example, Example, if I wanted to take this sound and put it over here on, uh, in towards the left-hand side of the stereo field and this other one and take it over towards the right, then again, I can do that within the mix flow, workflow very easily. So I've got a little bit of imaging now going on within my two sounds as well. But the mixer workflow works in a number of other ways as well. What I can also do is to reconfigure the order of tracks depending on whether or not it's useful for me to have them in different positions. Here's what I mean by that. Let's suppose what I wanted to do would be to say, okay, I want to introduce this reverb effect over the course of the, uh, the track. What I want to do actually is to turn up the amounts that I'm hearing from those two sounds. I'm gonna turn them up a lot so we get much more send from those two sounds going into the reverb but I want to be able to introduce the volume of the reverb over time. Here's what I mean. I'm gonna take all of the elements within my mix, and what I'm going to do is to copy them so that the track lasts a little bit longer. 
So what we've now got is a four bar track. And in fact, I could select all of those elements again and turn it into an eight bar track. And what I want to do is to fade up the reverb level as the track develops. In other words, I want it to start down at zero, down at sort of minus infinity, in fact, and then fade up to zero over the course of the track. Now, in order to do that, what I need to do is to introduce automation. I want to be able to draw a line of data that takes that volume information and fades it up through the duration of the track. And I can activate automation within the mixer as well. Here, what I can do is to turn on read mode, or I can turn on latch mode. And latch mode is gonna allow me to make that change in real time. So if I come back to the beginning, what I can now do is just introduce the volume as I want it to grow through the track. Okay, now straight away when I press stop, Logic has created a track for me within the arrangement. And you can see that it's just kind of put it where it wanted it to go. In fact, it's put it under the first sound that is using that reverb. So it's right here in the middle of the mixer. Now, of course, I can leave it there. That's fine if I want to. But what I can also do is to move it up to the top or put it at the bottom, wherever I want to put my auxiliary channels. If they're suddenly going to become part of my mixer and operational workflow, I need to put them in a place where I'm not going to lose track of them. And I tend to put them up at the top of my arrangements. Now that I've actually got that automation data that's written, I can come back into read mode to protect it. I'm not going to uh, make any more changes to it now, but I do want to be able to make sure that it's going to continue to play back. And then, of course, if I want to, what I can do is to press A to open automation mode and go and find that parameter that I introduced. And I can see the data that I wrote into the track and we can see that line that I introduced. So we can see that we can add automation data directly from within the mixer workflow as well. So we've now got a few different channels. We've got audio tracks, we've got software instruments, and we've also got auxiliary tracks operating within our project as well. And one of those is static, and one of them has been uh, had this uh, automation data added to it, so it's now part of our overall channel as well. Now, there's one more thing we're going to look at within this, uh, this section at the moment. You can see that all of the sounds ultimately are being sent. They're all being routed to the main stereo output. I can see that here. What I can do within the mixer is I can set any output I like. So if my audio interface has multiple outputs, I can, if I want to, choose to send any individual track to those outputs if I want. But because they're all being routed to the stereo output, which is this channel here, it makes sense that any effects that I add to that particular channel will affect everything within the mix. So if I decide that I want to slightly beef up the sound of my mix overall, I might come into here and grab Logic's adaptive limiter, which allows me to add some sort of uh, brick wall limiting to my project if I want to. I can set an output ceiling to prevent it overloading, but I could add some additional gain to the track overall. And what this is going to do is to affect everything within the project because all of those sounds are being sent through to this output channel. So within this video, we've seen a few things to do with Logic's workflow. We've seen that on an individual track basis, we can add individual effects, or we can set up auxiliaries from any individual channel. We can see that we can add automation mode to any individual track. And if we do that to an auxiliary, then it will suddenly appear within Logic's track area at the top, and we can move those around to reorder the tracks as we like. And we've also seen that in this particular arrangement, everything is by default routed through to the main stereo output. And so any effects we add to the output channel are, of course, going to affect everything within the mix.